So uh, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Hamid. Again, yesterday I was able to announce him so uh, and introduce him. So without further ado, we'll let him get into the uh, next talk, which is severe chest wall trauma in the era of precision medicine. Thanks, Dr. E. It's uh, so thrilling to be here. I didn't say that before. Uh, and uh, I, I'm um, so grateful to the conference organizers for inviting me and to, to all of you for your attention. <clears throat> um, especially grateful to uh, Dr. Perry and uh, Ball, who uh, I admire very much. So uh, I hope that there's no orthopedic surgeons in the audience today, because I'm about to give away one of their most prized secrets. When our trauma surgery group first started doing rib fracture fixation for flail chest, I was struck by how fun and satisfying the operation was. We got to work on the surface of the body, always with gorgeous exposure. We got to use a drill and screwdrivers and locking screws. And there was no need to worry about injuring any deep structures because we had depth gauges and drill guides that would keep the orientation of the drill true and that would keep the drill trip from plunging in. At the end, after a small amount of work, you get to admire a beautiful reconstruction. I remember telling one of uh, the orthopedic junior residents on our service, rib fracture fixation is so simple, it's practically foolproof. And she was smiling the whole time I was telling her this, and uh, she said, I hate to tell you this, but all of orthopedics is foolproof. Um, my enthusiasm for the procedure was really just part of a growing global interest in operative approaches for severe chest trauma. Flail chest is a common and devastating problem. 1,200 cases are reported to the NTDB every year, uh, and the short and long-term morbidity rates are startlingly high. The mortality approach is 30% in some series. Yet there's no strong consensus about how to address this problem. Surveys of trauma surgeons have shown that 82% of surgeons felt that Rib fixation is indicated for select patients, but only 22% of surgeons were aware of a randomized controlled trial that might guide their practice, and only 21% had ever even seen a case done. In the NTDB series, which was published in 2014, only 0.7% of flail chest patients underwent surgical fixation, and only 8% had epidurals. As better and safer methods of rib fracture fixation with better materials have been defined, more and more surgeons and surgical investigators have wondered what the best role for surgery is in the management of complex chest wall trauma. As you will see, the past five years have seen the publication of dozens of studies exploring the optimal management of flail chest, including observational studies, randomized trials, meta-analyses, and even a Cochrane review. But you will also see that the studies have been small and that our knowledge is still not definitive and that the patients and injury patterns span such a wide spectrum that no single study will be able to provide an answer for every clinical situation. The successful management of flail chest will depend on the way we as surgeons conduct, interpret, and apply high quality research, and on the way we apply our collective and individual experience and wisdom to each individual and unique patient. So consider these two cases. A 25-year-old motorcyclist sustains multiple injuries in a high-speed crash, he is persistently hypoxic, a right chest tube puts out uh, 1,100 milliliters of blood and demonstrates a persistent high volume air leak. A CT shows multiple displaced right-sided rib fractures, a pulmonary contusion, and a persistent hemothorax. It's a type of high energy mechanism seen every day at trauma centers around the world. Or how about this case? A 69-year-old woman is pinned against a wall in her garage by a slowly backing up minivan. She's awake and alert with good oxygen saturations and blood pressure of 140 over 90. Chest x-ray demonstrates multiple displaced bilateral rib fractures and a widened mediastinum, but no other abnormalities. She has a normal ECG, but elevation of her cardiac troponins. This is a low energy mechanism in an older patient with less physiologic reserve and more comorbidities. I know all of you can imagine even lower energy mechanisms like standing height falls that might lead to flail chest and even more frail patients than this one. So the question is, which of these patients is a candidate for rib fracture fixation? Before you answer that question, I thought we could start by considering the anatomy and physiology of flail chest and the often associated pulmonary contusions. There's no universal definition for flail chest, but most people agree that it's one of three things. Three or more consecutive rib fractures 
in two or more places, three or more consecutive bilateral rib fractures, or three or more consecutive fractures of ribs and sternum. A significant overlap of the ribs or significant chest wall deformity are also included in the spectrum of severe chest wall trauma. Chest wall instability is bad enough, but it is often associated with injury to the underlying lung parenchyma, or with time, inflammation, and atelectasis of the lung. This means that some alveoli get filled up with blood or edema and fail to oxygenate the blood streaming past. And that in turn means VQ mismatch, hypoxemia, and impending respiratory failure. We know that the combination of chest wall instability and underlying lung injury is bad. In the short term, it leads to high rates of pneumonia, sepsis, prolonged respiratory failure, tracheostomy, and mortality up to 33%. In the long term, it leads to poor pulmonary function, dyspnea, chest tightness, chronic pain, poor quality of life, and loss of full-time employment in 57% of our patients. Severe chest wall trauma is by itself an immediate threat to life, but it doesn't often occur in isolation. Surgeons treating flail chest also have to think about blunt, uh, blunt cerebrovascular injury, blunt aortic injury, blunt cardiac injury, like in the patient we saw earlier, esophageal trauma, pulmonary contusions, and lacerations, which in some cases may independently require long periods of mechanical ventilation or even surgical intervention, tracheobronchial injuries, pneumothorax, hemothorax, diaphragmatic injuries, and associated abdominal injuries, or any combination of these injuries. I mentioned all these injuries to emphasize that there are no two patients alike in terms of injury pattern or in terms of physiology, and therefore perhaps no study that can dictate our minute-to-minute -minute priorities and decisions in the minutes and hours after injury. And it's not just the acute phase of illness that might guide our decision-making. The outstanding studies by John Mayberry and colleagues have been a constant reminder that our management of severe chest wall trauma also has long-term implications. It's clear that when it comes to managing flail chest and pulmonary contusion, the decisions we make are consequential. So what are some of these decisions actually? The modern standard of care has been to take care of the lungs, through the selective application of invasive or non-invasive mechanical ventilation uh, to keep the alveoli recruited and to keep them open by stabilizing the chest wall. Recent studies, such as this one by Hernandez uh, and a 2013 systematic review by Chamello, have suggested that non-invasive ventilation improves oxygenation, reduces complications, and reduces the need for mechanical ventilation. I personally think that in select patients, BiPAP is a really powerful adjunct in the management of flail chest pulmonary contusion. <clears throat> as far as uh, pain control goes, numerous studies have shown that epidural analgesia can effectively reduce pain and improve function while minimizing somnolence and ileus. This may be especially important in older patients as we heard in one of the research talks yesterday. Despite some studies that have not detected measurable benefits on clinical outcomes, including this 2007 meta-analysis, the 2004 EAST guidelines have supported the use of epidurals as an optimal strategy for pain relief and possibly improved outcomes in severe chest wall trauma. Selective positive pressure ventilation and adequate analgesia in a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach that includes excellent nursing and physiotherapy care is a powerful combination. In studies like this one from Houston, a holistic approach drastically reduces complications and improves meaningful outcomes. This is modern, non-operative care at its best and should be the benchmark against which all new innovations, including operative rib fixation, should be measured. And speaking of rib fixation, after seeing how powerful, conscientious, non-operative management can be, do you think we should be operating on these patients? Mayberry's study showed that consensus among surgeons varied according to the indication, highest for chest wall defects with pulmonary herniation and lowest for flail chest not requiring mechanical ventilation. Other experts have suggested that uh, broad categories for surgical intervention, flail chest with failure to wean, um, severe pain, uh, chest wall deformity, non-union, and on the way out after thoracotomy for other reasons. But these are all opinions and not necessarily based on high quality data. As I mentioned before, better technique, like attention to reduction, stability of fixation, preservation of blood supply, and early mobilization uh, are, are, are changing our approach to surgical fixation. 
there have been an explosion of uh, uh, studies in the last decade. Um, I'll just show you this uh, retrospective cohort. Um, this res ret retrospective study by uh, Ahmed and colleagues show markedly better outcomes with rib fixation in terms of morbidity and mortality. A similar study by Wagenreiter <clears throat> Uh, showed marked reduction in ventilator days for patients with operative chest stabilization, but only in patients without a significant pulmonary contusion. Lardinois looked at a more long-term outcome, return to work, in this series, and showed some remarkable results with operative fixation with 100% return to work in two months. There have been loads of observational studies showing benefit of operative fixation, but the real game-changing study in the history of operative rib fixation to date is this one, published by Tanaka and colleagues from Japan in 2002. This study randomized 37 patients with refractory respiratory failure on post-injury day five to surgical fixation with Jude A struts uh, versus continued splinting with positive pressure ventilation. And the results were dramatic. Less pneumonia, less mechanical ventilation, fewer tracheotomies, better long-term pulmonary function, fewer chronic symptoms, and faster return to work with surgical fixation. <clears throat> Tanaka's randomized trial was followed in 2005 by an Egyptian randomized control trial of 40 patients. This one too showed big differences in pneumonia, ventilator and ICU days, and chest wall deformity favoring surgical fixation, and they used stainless steel wires or K-wires. And finally, uh, in uh, 2014, came the third blockbuster, an Australian randomized control trial that randomized 46 patients to operative fixation with resorbable polyactide copolymer plates or modern multidisciplinary care. The results, you guessed it, rib fixation was associated with less need for invasive positive pressure ventilation, fewer ICU days, fewer tracheostomies, and a trend toward fewer cases of pneumonia. <clears throat> the last two years have seen more data emerge this propensity study uh, from Japan uh, showed that rib fixation was associated with fewer patients requiring long-term ventilation. And this excellent prospective study from Denver, hot off the presses this year, showed better pulmonary function and dramatic reductions in respiratory failure and tracheostomy rates after the adoption of rib fracture fixation. In 2013, two meta-analyses came out. One by our group included 11 comparative studies with 753 patients and found that surgical fixation was associated with lower vent and ICU days and markedly lower pneumonia, sepsis, tracheostomy, and chest wall deformity rates than the than non-operative management. The other meta-analysis of nine studies with 538 patients reached similar results. And in 2015, we even got a Cochrane review that combined the three RCTs that, we've been, that have been completed to date to show decreased pneumonia and decreased tracheostomy rates in patients undergoing operative fixation for their rib fractures. These studies uh, did not include the potential benefits of delayed rib fixation for non-union, nor did they report real and significant operative complications such as hardware infection. <clears throat> But the liter literature on chest wall fixation has bigger issues. Most studies are observational and are prone to bias. Um, and while the randomized trials have in part addressed the issue of bias, they've been limited by small sample sizes, uh, and in some cases by variations in the care within the non-operative comparison group. As strong as the signals are, we're re we are, uh, re we are ready, ba are we ready based on trials involving only 123 patients to change the way we care for patients with severe chest wall trauma. When we, this is a study that, uh, that we have in press right now, which compared our first operative fixation patients to well-matched historical controls, similar to the Denver study. We couldn't measure any advantage of rib fixation. We wondered if our non-operative care has gotten better with time and if ribs simply tend to heal on their own. Still, rib fracture fixation has found its way into clinical practice, even though the indications and outcomes are still incompletely understood. <clears throat> Our trauma center in Vancouver uh, is contributing patients to a multi-center randomized control trial that is getting close to its target of 200 patients, and we expect that this will provide a clear comparison of operative and non-operative management in the North American context. It's possible that because of the complexity of injury and patient factors in severe chest wall trauma, 
that no trial will be able to capture uh, what we should do for an individual multi-trauma patient, and the results of any trial will need to be interpreted with specific patient factors in mind. A tailored approach to non-operative and operative management for individual patients might be guided by a predictive tool like the RIB score that enables us to visualize our patients' futures with greater certainty. In another fantastic study from Denver, investigators used six radiographic criteria that are available on the admission CT scan to predict outcomes after severe chest wall trauma and potentially to guide interventions. These six findings included six or more rib fractures, bilateral fractures, flail chest, three or more severely displaced fractures, a first rib fracture, or at least one fracture in three of the anatomic areas, anterior, lateral, or posterior. They assigned one point to each finding and came up with a zero to six score that was both sensitive and specific to the development of complications as you see here. The upper, low, uh, the upper row of ROC uh, curves show um, uh, multi-trauma patients um, and how sensitive and specific um, the rib score was. And the lower one is isolated rib fracture patients without multi-trauma. And you can see that the score is even more predictive. So with this score, we begin to glimpse uh, how we can use individual patient characteristics to predict risk and intervention very early in the post-injury course. Imagine automatically combining the rib score to predict respiratory failure, pneumonia, and tracheostomy with, uh, with other data, like data on age, blood gas results, um, comorbidities, or associated injuries to the clavicle and scapula, which each have their own scores. Once we start to combine scores together, you could get an idea of how each patient might have their own combination of interventions to optimize their outcomes. I believe that severe chest wall trauma is a brilliant opportunity for precision medicine. Recognizing that some of our patients fall from standing while others are ejected 100 feet, that some are old and some are young, that some have comorbidities and others don't, and there are a million combinations of injuries to the lung, chest wall, shoulder, and elsewhere that can modify a patient's trajectory. We can begin to collect and analyze and share data that support our best judgment and our most conscientious patient care. Thank you very much. Questions from the audience? Please introduce yourself. Grace Dinkins, Southern California and Liberia. Um, I work at a couple of level two trauma centers and I went, underwent the rib fixation course. It was a wonderful course. It um, was um, very uh, eye-opening. Came back home and found tremendous pushback from the thoracic surgeons who felt that um, trauma surgeons shouldn't be doing these because we didn't have the uh, wherewithal to do long-term follow-up or the ability to deal with the long-term complications such as infection of hardware. And we did, didn't want our fingers in the sternal fractures either, which, um, you know, they have a fixation of those as well. And what do you think we should be saying to our uh, thoracic colleagues? Uh, it's such an interesting question. Uh, I think uh, this, is, this uh, particular injury pattern is, is at the confluence of uh, trauma surgery, uh, thoracic surgery, and even orthopedics. And uh, there was a three-way race at our hospital to see um, who could do this first. And, I think trauma surgeons have a strong argument to do this. Uh, we see the patients first. Uh, we're responsible for their multi-system injuries. And I think we probably have a better understanding of the overall physiology of a trauma patient than an elective thoracic surgeon does. Um, I think there's strong arguments for that. Um, but how to advise uh, what to do in an individual institution is hard. Um, I think what works for us is um, to, uh, to do, it, do something and then ask for, for forgiveness later. Um, we try to engage our thoracics and our orthopedic surgeons as experts and to say, like, we're going to go ahead and do this and we'd love to have your support and backup uh, if we ever get into trouble. Uh, and that's sort of a collaborative approach. It was sort of a transparent and collaborative but not completely transparent approach uh, allowed us to get these patients onto our service, where I think they get pretty, pretty good day-to-day -day care. The orthopedic surgeons tried to make a play for this too, but they never operate on the chest, nor do they know how to manage lung injuries or... Uh, manage even chest yeah, they're, tubes. They're easier about it. It's they're they're the, easier. It's yeah. the thoracic surgeons. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think uh, I think to be motivated by the best interests of the patients and the you know to optimize patient care and stay patient focused. Um, I think that if we think of that, then there's a strong argument for trauma to take the lead here. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, so I'd like to comment on that and, and extend the dialogue a little bit. I think we're ahead of schedule, so it affords that. So I think you ask a very important question, which is going to be different than based on which country you're at. And then when we're talking about within the United States, it also, talk, it, it also varies highly depending on your institution and what type of trauma that you do. So there are places in this country where you know, the trauma surgeons uh, uh, have full capability of doing these types of procedures and nobody's around to question what they do. But the majority of the trauma centers, the local politics are going to be difficult. And if you try to do these types of procedures and there's all sorts of people that are worried about you uh, going into their territory and they're worried about cases being taken. And this is, and, and the frustrating part is that orthopedics won't fix ribs and thoracic surgeons don't fix ribs. But if you fix ribs, they get angry about it. Yeah. And then the politics are that, you know, even if you're right and you can try to get that done, you, there's aftermath on the politics about, uh, you know, whether they're going to come and make your life a little bit more miserable afterwards in one way or the other or take you to the medical board or make you, take you to the credentialing aspect to see how you've been trained. <clears throat> And so for me, with rib, you know, uh, I, I've, been, I've been pretty successful of, of doing sternal fractures. I think sternal fractures, I, I, I fix every one of them that I can get a hold of. And I think walking around with a broken bone doesn't make any sense nowadays. And if you had a broken femur, for us to say that it'll heal in six weeks and you just hurt in pain for that time period doesn't make any sense. So whether it's displaced or not, if they have pain, I'll fix them. If you show me a, a sternal fracture that has no symptoms, I won't fix it. But if they're symptomatic, I do it. But with rib fractures, I, the, the biggest problem for me is that a lot of them have a lot of pain from a lot of ribs. And do you fix every single one of them or just a few of them has been a big question. And, and I have, ten, have I had a tendency not to do as much rib fixation because I don't know what the indications are. Uh, Dave Vitrika, Phoenix. Um, so I'm a pediatric surgeon and I do a lot of chest reconstructive surgery. So uh, pectus excavatum and uh, other anomalies uh, in cancer. I, I don't think um, that there's any reason that a trauma surgeon can't do rib surgery. So the truth is um, you are a thoracic surgeon in patients who are the sickest. There, there is no complication that you can cause with, um, uh, with rib fixation that uh, isn't trauma and that you don't know how to manage because you are the person who manages lung injury. So I don't think that that argument holds. The, the other thing is, um, as far as managing complications, the reality is um, we learn to manage complications of everything else that we do. And if we get complications from it, we will learn to manage that as well. Right. You're, it's going to come down to two questions. Do you leave the hardware in or do you take the hardware out? And, you know, um, there's, there's nice literature on, on uh, other chest uh, bar implants of how to manage those. And it, it's certainly within the skill set. So the concept that trauma surgeons can't do it, it's not a reasonable argument. And the other, one last comment is there is a timeliness to the decision of when you uh, fixate these ribs that the other specialists are not going to be able to meet that time frame because you are a trauma surgeon and an emergency general surgeon and taking care of things that are not scheduled is what you do for a living. That's a great point. Thank you for those two excellent points. I, I totally agree with them. Yeah, Felipe Vega from Mexico City. Do you have any experience or have you evidence about uh, radio frequency for chest uh, for uh, for pain? No, I don't. Uh, we haven't used it. Um, we've we've just mainly uh, focused on uh, acute pain management and uh, surgical fixation for non-union in the long term. We've done a few of those cases, but we've never used RFA for pain control. Uh, have you had an experience with it? Yeah, we have um, a couple of cases about uh, uh, flight chest with uh, radio frequency with a uh, good outcome. Yeah. Oh, great. That's great. I'd be interested to hear about that. Yeah, um, my brother is a colonel in the Marine Corps. He's a pretty tough guy, and he's got black belt in judo. And, uh, but he says the most painful thing that he's ever had in his life was a cracked rib. You know, it lasts for two months, and you know, that's the one thing that I always try to tell my patients with cracked ribs is that it's gonna last for six weeks, because if you don't tell them that, in about a month, they're cursing you out in sleep when they wake up with this pain every time they cough or laugh. And you know, for bones to be not fixed and in pain for a long period of time, 
doesn't make much sense to me nowadays that we're fixing all the other bones. And, and even with clavicles, there are a lot of orthopedic surgeons that are, are, uh, are recommending that you fix every clavicular fracture for, from the pain perspective. When, when I was, uh, Dr. Rhee, when I was on the way uh, to the course, to, to the initially to, to learn how to do this rib fixation, I was on the shuttle with a mixed martial arts fighter. That reminds me of the story about your brother. And uh, he was looking at interest to, at my brochure that I was flipping to, and he actually asked if he could borrow it and keep it. He thought it'd be a great way to uh, extend his mixed martial arts career to get uh, these uh, titanium plates inserted. Morad, there is a question from the audience, from the web. Uh, could you repeat the number of rib fractures and flay segments which warrant a surgical fixation? Uh, the number. So um, the, that's a great question. Uh, the inclusion criteria for our randomized trial, I'll give you those, the inclusion criteria perhaps as a guide. I think there's no right answer. But uh, for entry into the uh, multi-center randomized trial, it's uh, three or more ribs that are fractured in two or more places, or three or more ribs that are with bilateral fractures, so either side of the sternum, or three or more ribs with an associated sternal fracture. Those are three of the criteria. Um, but they also added two more criteria, which is complete displacement of three or more ribs, um, or um, uh, uh, chest wall deformity. So if the chest really looks pushed in, those are all, uh, those all meet the definition of chest wall instability and would be inclusion criteria into the study. Uh, now I know some people are, are plating even one rib fracture. Uh, sometimes a non-union uh, hurts a lot, like uh, several months out, and so people are plating individual ribs. I think that's on a case-by-case -case basis. But for flail chest um, and for inclusion into study, that's, those are the criteria that we're using. Well, great. Well, thank you so much.